Do you look for approval from other people? Now, you might say, well, I don't care what other people say about me, but this often means something else. It's more of a cry for help, as in, I really want people to appreciate me, to value my opinion, to approve of what I do, but I just can't seem to please anyone. Yes, we want to please other people. It begins in early childhood. As soon as uh, you learn what it means to obey your parents and, uh, and be rewarded or disobey and be punished. That's a universal principle of uh, carrot and stick, rewards and punishment. You listen, people are pleased with you. You do something bad, they're displeased. You will be punished. The uh, system is so basic to our nature that that euphemism of carrot and stick it even goes to the animals even dogs if you ever train them get this pretty quick they want to please you they don't want to be punished you don't want to be bad you don't want to disappoint you want to do good. You want to please. Now, this natural, reflexive idea that you need to be good, you need to please, that we learn at home pretty fast, it's strengthened in school. And then it's solidified when you get your job. We seek approval of others to get better grades, to get better hours at work, to get more money, to get promotion. We do our best to please our parents, our teachers, our boss. Virtually all areas of our lives work that way. Drive better and you will get Lower insurance rates. Do better with your finances and you'll get a better credit score and approve for a better loans and mortgages. Now, all this doing better and, and pleasing others works in our real life, but also works in the virtual reality. Those of you who post on social media, you have to admit that you like those likes and those clicks because they indicate the approval of other people. And that's at least a part of why you share those things, even if you don't want to admit to it. You like those likes, seeing that it's so much a part of our human nature to like, to seek God's approval, to seek people's approval, it's no wonder that we translate the same into our spiritual life. Just think about our understanding of how God works. We think that we need to do good to please Him. We need to do our best so that we get noticed and get rewarded. That's been a part of the world's religion for as long as we can remember because they rely on that principle of rewards and punishment. You do good and God will be pleased with you. You do bad and he will be angry with you. Therefore, your job is always to please God. Now, from the beginning of the Christian church, even this thinking, this worldly thinking, and this other religious world's thinking made it inro its inroads into Christianity as well. Paul, St. Paul spoke extensively about this type of thinking 
about the idea that you, well, Jesus died for you on the cross, but now you have to do good works. Now you need to have those righteous deeds, and now you can earn God's favor. He spoke against those things, for example, in the letter to the Romans and to the Galatians. It nevertheless, the idea that you still need to please God so you can be rewarded by him, it still made its way into the life of the church that taught that your righteous works is what wins God's approval, and it earns you the ultimate reward, life in heaven. It's obviously it left people doubting that they would ever be good enough in order to please God because their human experiences contributed to that uncertainty. Because it's so hard to always please your parents and your teachers and your employer. How can I ever please God constantly? Now, the Reformation movement brought back the gospel, the cross of Christ, and the truth that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone, not by works. And so this gospel or this evangelical proclamation has been at the root of the evangelical movement for the last 500 plus years. But so strong is ingrained this idea that we still need to be good because it just makes sense to us that even this type of thinking made once again its appearance and it's quite popular when people tell you, well, Jesus died for you on the cross. And now, you must be good. Yes, Jesus has given you eternal life, but now you must obey him and do what pleases him. This is what happens when you preach the cross alone and not the means of grace. So, is God pleased with you. Have you committed your life to him? How about your resources, including your tithes and your offerings? What about your time? Are the things that you do please God? Are you doing enough volunteering and serving? Do you please God in your love and your dedication to your spouse? How about your children? If we ask them, do they see you as God-pleasing parent? Is the Lord pleased in all the areas of your life? In your school, at your job? Is God pleased with you? Listen to this. The waters of your baptism covered you three times. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And heaven was opened for you. And all your sins were buried in that watery grave. And were taken, all your sins were taken by Jesus upon himself in his baptism. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. That's the word that was spoken at Jesus' baptism. Now Jesus' baptism was unique in that he did not have to be baptized because he was sinful, because he was sinless. He didn't have to be cleansed for his sins. 
Rather, his baptism was pointing forward to the cross, to his death and to his resurrection in your place, in my place, in the place of sinners. It's at the cross that his baptism and my baptism and your baptism meet. And that's what our New Testament text is all about. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You have new life. God is pleased with you because in holy baptism, Jesus has joined you to his death. His death for your sin. And now he takes the forgiveness that he won at the cross and gives it to you by water and the word. In holy baptism, you have died with Christ. You have been crucified with him. You have been buried with him. The judgment for your sin has already been carried out. That's why death and sin, they have no claim on you. That's why hell, that's why hell doesn't have anything on you. Jesus hasn't just died for your sin. He still comes to you. You are child of God. God is pleased with you. There's more. Not only are you united with Jesus in his death, you're also united to him in his resurrection. He has saved you from hell to heaven, from death to life, from not being ever be able to please God to I am pleased with you. You're no longer a slave who doubts that he can earn his freedom. You're a child of God with whom he is well pleased. How can you be sure of that? Because it doesn't depend on you. He gives it all to you. He has given it all to you in your baptism. He has joined you to his death and his resurrection. That new life has begun now. Now daily, you and I will sin. Daily, that old Adam will want us to question and to entice us back to the slavery of wanting to please, of questioning whether we're good enough, trying to earn favors. But daily, you and I remember our baptism. Daily, you and I confess our sins before God and rejoice in his forgiveness. Daily, you and I say, I've acted once again like a dead, hopeless, sinful slave. I haven't done what is pleasing in God's sight. I have proven once again that I cannot earn that salvation and forgiveness. But that's not I who lives anymore. Because Jesus has joined me to his death and to his resurrection, made me alive in him. Therefore, as I confess those sins which try to enslave me again, I rejoice. I'm happy. I'm blessed because by the grace of God, I am alive because Jesus has joined me to his resurrection. I am a son of God. God is pleased with me. God declares to you, 
You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And that's God's promise. Now and forever. Because you're baptized. And you are forgiven of all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.